Good morning, everyone. Thanks for joining us, everybody who's online, everyone who's here in person. Um, let's all stand to our feet this morning and uh, join in uh, praising the Lord.
teach my song to rise to you when temptation comes my way when i cannot stand or fall on you and jesus you're my hope and stay
my days, Jesus, I am yours, and I am yours, I am yours, for all my days, Jesus, I Um, for this day. We thank you for this time where we could gather together. We thank you for your love that came down um, so that each of us could have salvation in you, God. We pray that you would just um, bless this Sunday. We thank you that we could all be here um, online in person. We just thank you um, for this day that you've given us, and we pray that we would just um, just stay steadfast in your love. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Good to see everybody. Hey, before you sit down, why don't you just Turn around and wave at somebody and say hi. You know, we quit, I quit doing the handshake stuff so much, but hey, hey, say hi, greet you. Okay, very good. Excelente. Good to be here. Good to see you. Go ahead and have a seat. I'm happy to be here. Um, I, uh, I know pretty much everybody that's regular here knows that uh, Friday, Mary Lynn had surgery. My wife, Mary Lynn, had surgery. Um, it was success. The surgery was successful. There were a couple moments that were a little, you know, I got a note from the, or the doctor called me and said, hey, everything went great. N no other indications of cancer, but you won't know till you get the pathology report back. And, you know, there's all this stuff. So I'm like, okay, cool. So then I go up, I wait. But one thing about Mary Lynn, she's always been very sensitive to any kind of medicine. So it took a long, so she woke, it, you know, they said, oh, it'll be a half hour, 45 minutes, and you can go in and see her. Well, I wait, 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 wait. And so then basically two hours later, they call me, and she's having a really hard time waking up. And, but, but I, I was talking to Anna at the time, my daughter Anna, and I'm like, well, um, I mean, if she takes NyQuil, she sleeps till 10 a.m. And she also has, like, if she takes, like, a Claritin, she's like, oh, I'm so tired. And I'm like, okay, so this is not really a shock to me. But there was some sort of a lab error that got the doctors all concerned because her blood cell count was about half of what it should have been. So then they come in with bags of blood. The, the doctor, the surgeon comes back, the anesthesiologist comes back, the whole room, so I'm kind of standing over in a corner with this whole room of nurses doing all kinds of different testing and stuff. And, but then the doctor's like looking at her and he's going, at this time we don't know it's a lab error, we're just having this really low blood count. But then the, the doctor and the anesthesiologist, they're looking at her going, well, you know, she, the, the readings up here look pretty good. Her blood pressure was a little low. And it was taken, but that can be because the, an, the anesthetic, and it was kind of taken a while. And then the blood pressure started coming up a little bit. She doesn't have any, like, major swelling. The, the heart beats good. The, all these other indications are good. She is looking better and better as we go. So then the doctor's like, I think it's some kind of a lab error. And so then they, but then Meriden also is like one of these people that's hard to draw blood on. So the... Uh, the, do the nurses were having trouble drawing blood, so then the, the, the anesthesiologist, I guess he's an expert at this, so he was able to find a vein on her hand and wait and take a long time, finally got the blood. Then they did like a quick check and it looked good. Then they got the lab results, yeah, it's fine. It was a mistake, somehow it got diluted in the process of that first time around. 
but uh, and then that it was funny because then the doctor goes well you know I, I thank you guys for all staying so calm and i'm like and I'm, and I'm like, you know, I, I should have said something like, well, I was really trusting in the Lord. But what I said was, well, you guys were all speaking a bunch of medical jargon. I didn't have any idea what's going on. So <laughs> why would I get all upset about it? You know, what I mean? so that, that's the truth. So anyhow, Mary Lynn wrote a little note uh, that she wanted me to share with you all. So she has, she can tell the whole story from her side, but eh, she, I, I think my side's better because I was awake. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and she said this, thank you so much for your continued prayer and support. I feel like we have an entire army going before us and feel very safe in the arms of Jesus. So happy to have the surgery over and the good report. I cannot fully express how much it means to me to have such an amazing, loving church to help us through this time in our lives. You are all truly the best church ever. Hopefully, uh, my recovery will be quick and I'll be able to see you all soon. God is so good and continues to move in amazing ways, so I have lots of good stories to tell you all when I see you. Love, Mary Lynn. Um, I hope I didn't steal too many of her stories, but she has more stuff. So um, anyhow, that was, uh, everything's going as well as can be expected. You know, you find out what you find out when you find it out. So we're just taking one day at a time and all the other cliches you can think of, but the reason people say that all the time and they're kind of cliches is because it's the truth. All you can do is live today and be thankful for today and live tomorrow tomorrow it's going to have its as jesus said it has its own problems so look my evidently my slide of of joe and what esther didn't completely load and didn't really realize that till right now but the missionary of the week is joe and esther wagnell um, i know they're still traveling around the united states uh, and they're in the area uh, doing ministry and uh you know, reporting back to the churches that support them. This week, in fact, Joe is preaching up at Gunner's Church, and uh, he's up there, and they've got another, I think, until like March, and then they leave this area, and then they go back to Africa in, um, I think I think in the first part, May or June, something like that, uh, early, early, late spring, early summer. And then the, um, the other thing about them, just in case you don't know, well, we're going to pray for them, but there, he's an aviation missionary in Africa, and he, uh, he, he basically keeps these planes for uh, African Inland Mission up in the air, and then they use them for all kinds of ministry for people who are, especially people who are doing ministry out in the bush where it's like you don't really have roads there. It allows people to have access to medical care and other things that they need, especially emergency things, also food. Information. Just, just a lot of things that it does to really, really help and facilitate ministry. So let's pray for them. Father, I just thank you for Joe and Esther. I thank you for the blessing that Joe was when he was here a couple, a couple months ago. And I just pray your, your hand a blessing on their home, their family, their ministry. I pray for the other uh, brother who's filling in for Joe while he's away uh, and who's also his partner in working there that you'll just bless him and just give him wisdom and whatever he comes up across, uh, against in repairing and, and opportunities to share the gospel. And I just pray for Joe and Esther. I thank you for their faithfulness. Thank you that, they're, uh, that, that Lord, you're using them in a great way. Bless them up there uh, at Gunner's Church today. Uh, and uh, I just pray your blessing on them and their ministry in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, just a couple quick things. You know, if you're watching online, appreciate it. And you can go to the Facebook Live and do like and share. Those really matter. Uh, make a comment. That's cool. YouTube also, like, share, uh, subscribe. And then, that, then if you subscribe, it'll, it just dings your phone or your whatever when you get, uh, you get it. So that's always good. And then also, I just want to say praise the Lord. I'm so, so thankful for you guys, your faithfulness and your giving. Um, Kathy is right here. Kathy has the giving records from 2021, and so if you don't have that, uh, she's the person to see after church. So anyhow, that'll be that. That's I, I just really am so thankful. This you, the whole church is just such a, a gracious, giving, wonderful body of people, and I'm just totally blessed. And and you know, I, I this whole thing with Mary Lynn um, being. Uh, with the surgery and then several different prayer groups were going and and it was kind of interesting because over the course of your life 
you meet a lot of different people. And in a couple of the different groups, you could see like, you know, people that you know that know other people and some of these connections that you're not, re you weren't really even aware of or people that, you know, like were friends of Mary Lynn's in high school back in the 70s. And then people who were, we were friends when we were living in the Bay Area, people who were friends when we lived in Spain, people who were friends from different angles around this area. So it was, you know, um, I do think there's something about that I feel for me and also for Mary Lynn was that, you know, when you live your life trying to help somebody, trying to help people, you know what? Everybody kind of remembers. And God, God uses that. And like you say, she feels like, you know, like was so supported and so encouraged through the whole uh, prayer of everything. Uh, and it was just, it was just a huge blessing. So we're blessed. I'm blessed to be here. I'm blessed by you guys. I'm thankful for every single one of you. So anyhow. We're going to go ahead and dismiss the children to the class. Ga Miss Gale is teaching today, I believe. And so we're going to pray. Why don't we hold for a second until we pray, and then the kids will go after we pray, okay? Father, we just thank you and praise you for your goodness, for your love, for your mercy. We thank you that Jesus came to this earth, that he paid the price for our sins. We're thankful that we have the opportunity to serve you we're thankful for the brothers and sisters who are part of the church, who, who are just acquaintances, who people who we can lift each other up and build each other up and encourage one another. And we just are thankful how you use that, Father. Bless us today. Bless our time together in your word. And may you speak to our hearts in Jesus' name. Amen. Good to see everybody. I'm going to ha I have, um, I invited, I knew my, um, so the children are dismissed uh, to the class. It's up to what sixth grade, roughly. Okay, so the the um, so we're really happy for visitors that are here today, and any visitors who are here, we're thankful for all of you. I I knew that Mary Lynn's surgery was scheduled for Friday, and I wasn't sure what was going to happen after that. And she ended up spending the night at the hospital. So I took her home yesterday afternoon or took her up to Anna and Gunner's house. Our house, in case you don't know, we live with a whole bunch of stairs. Like from where you park the car to our front door is about 45 s stair steps. So it's, uh, it's great, it's nice, but it's also kind of hard walking when you just had surgery. So we're, we stay at, we're gonna stay up at Anna and Gunner's for a few days. And um, um, so I wasn't sure what was gonna happen. I wasn't sure how long it was gonna be. I was hoping to be here today, but I wasn't sure how much preparation time I was going to have. So I, I started thinking, and, and God put on my heart Mark Salazar, and he's been, uh, he's been doing ministry for years. Uh, he works with uh, youth. I'm going to let him explain it a little bit more. But I've known Mark's wife since probably almost as long as I've known anybody in San Diego because she was a high school girl when I was teaching high school in the 90s, and uh, she's about my daughter's age. So anyhow, I was thinking about Mark and his, my, his, I don't know, I was praying like, Lord, what do I do? And all of a sudden, Mark Salazar. And I called Mark, he was available. So I'm, I'm thinking it's gonna be a huge blessing. I'm looking forward to it. So come on up, Mark. Good. All right, good morning. Oh, that's a good hearty welcome from the chapel. Thank you guys. Uh, so uh, my name is Mark Salazar, born and raised here in San Diego. It's a blessing to be here and, and share the Word of God with you. Uh, and uh, I'm going to share a little bit with the ministry I'm doing. So I got saved uh, November 4th, 1998. Uh, about a year later, I went out to the Pittsburgh area to, to uh, work with a group called Christian Sports International. And what I was able to do is they put me in a host family. I played semi-pro ball at night, and I got to work uh, faith-based baseball camps during the day. Um, after the first summer there, I was hooked and felt really that was like God's affirmation to, to full-time ministry. And then from there, I became a youth pastor. 2010, planted a church in Indio, California. Um, went back in youth ministry for about a year and a half. And in the last six years, I've been doing sports ministry. Um, full circle back now, I'm with Christian Sports International. So um, it's a huge blessing. I'm going to show a quick one-minute promo video to give you an idea of some of the things that I do. And then I'll give you another minute about what I do. And if anyone's interested, love to talk to you after the service. And then we're going to bring the word. Are we all good? All right. Here is the video, I think.
That's our mission right there. So pretty much with Christian Sports International, we use the platform of sports to share the gospel. So at the end of the day, it doesn't matter if we do uh, a baseball camp. We have travel um, sports right now. So right now I'm running three teams uh, under, under uh, our umbrella for travel baseball. I have someone coming on staff right now to run travel volleyball and do club volleyball. We actually have campus ministry where student athletes reach out to us and we do um, Bible studies on campus. We partner with churches like the chapel. We would, we would do like a sports team, uh, VBS. Uh, and then we also have other events like, you know, day at the lake going fishing and whatnot, stuff like that. So, um, and then we have usually two fundraisers a year. So I'm a missionary, and we use the platform of sports to share the gospel. That is what we do in a nutshell. And uh, uh, honor and privilege to be here this morning to open up the Word of God with us. So if you could, let us uh, open up our Bibles to John chapter 20. We're going to start in John chapter 20. And as you're turning there, uh, I'm going to uh, open us up with a word of prayer, and we'll get cracking. Well, Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your grace, your love, your mercy, Lord. Thank you for the, the honor and privilege of just being able to open up the Word of God together. And may you be glorified, and we just pray uh, as we open up the Word, Lord, that you would be preparing our hearts to receive your Word. We love you, praise you, and we ask, Lord, that you just fill us this morning. In Jesus' name, everybody said? Amen. All right, so the title of the message is The Assurance of Salvation. I think the assurance of salvation is something that uh, a lot of people struggle with. Uh, believers, people that are in the church, not sure if they're saved, and so forth. And um, I've been thinking about this a lot lately because I've had a lot of people close to me actually pass away in the last several months. So it, it's really triggered that. And uh, what's interesting is my, my pastor actually has passed away a few months ago. And I got a bookmark here uh, of my pastor just to remind me to preach the word. Um, he just, I, love, I love Pastor John, and, and he is um, an amazing expositor of God's word. And uh, so I've lost people like my pastor, people on the mission field, the president of our organization. And it's just been really uh, insane. And then a few weeks ago, uh, one of my friends from high school, uh, this guy that I've known since I was 15 years old, I heard that he passed away. Uh, and it had nothing to do with with COVID, had, he had, apparently he drank too much and had liver and kidney failure. And I'm thinking, man, here's a guy who's a year older than me and who's gone to this. And, and I say this because um, I was sad because not, not only do you, you lose somebody you know or a friend, we start thinking, like, where are they at with the Lord? So I'll just put it this way. When someone like my pastor passed away, John Leader, we're super sad and we're mourning, but we're mourning in a way that we're missing him and the blessing he is into our life. We know these with the Lord, 100%. And so we can rejoice and celebrate. Now on the flip side, a friend who recently passed away that I've known since I was 15 years old, I've known him, so what is that? I'm almost, so I'm 43, so that's 18-ish years, if I did the math correctly. And um, I don't know if he's saved. I'll be honest, I don't know. There's been, I've known him time and time again to make a profession of faith. When things are, are difficult, we run to the church. And then things got good again, and then he left the church. You know what I'm saying? So it's, it's kind of like that back and forth. But I never, and this is a good friend of mine, I, I look back, I'm like, I don't know if I've ever seen, like, spiritual fruit come out of his life. And so when, when I don't see any spiritual fruit, and there's a profession, that's like, I don't know, what, I don't know if he is or not. And... Now, here's the thing that I want to encourage you with, and, and it could come off sounding not right right now. Is look, you and I, we're not to be the fruit inspectors, right? Only the Lord, he's the final judge, and he's the true fruit inspector. That's not our job to do that. But as I consider someone's life, and do I get to celebrate their life with Christ or not, it makes me think about those things. And it makes me consider that. And it makes, it's, it, I'm reminded of, man, like, how do I know that I am saved? What's the assurance that I have, Right? So I'm evaluating myself, I'm thinking about other friends and other family and, and whatnot that I'm praying for that are on my list, and some that are bearing fruit, and it's amazing, so I'm, continue, I'm praying that they would continue to bear much fruit, and there are some who are struggling, and I don't know if they're saved, and do I need to have the one-on-one -on -one conversation with them? Do I need to take them out for coffee and say, hey, like, are you saved? How do you know? Uh, so it just, this has been something on my mind over the last several months, and the scripture that is going to be our main uh, uh, portion today is actually going to be John 15, which we'll get to in a second. 
um, which is a famous part of Scripture. And it's been probably my, my favorite portion of Scripture over the 20-some-odd years of me being saved, by the way. But I also have wrestled with this piece of Scripture for so long. In, in verse 6 that we'll get to later on, just kind of disclaimer, uh, I used to preach John 1 through 8 without touching 6 because I didn't know the interpretation. I wrestled with it. And, and so, and then I felt like I landed on it. And I'm like, oh my gosh, Jesus, I keep studying scripture as I'm growing in Christ. I realize, oh my gosh, here it is. So today you're getting the cleaned up version of John chapter 15. So lucky you, you're getting 20 years of study here. So hopefully I get it right, right? So um, Lord be with us. But yeah, we, that's my prayer is that the Lord would just be our teacher this morning. And so as we get into John chapter 15, I just want to remind us in John 20, which you're there with me, that we would look at the overall theme of John. Um, the Gospel of John, here's, here's the, the main point of the Gospel of John. It's found in John 20, 31. It says, But these things are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. So John, his letter is written to prove that Jesus Christ is the Messiah. He is the Son of God. And that by believing in him that you and I would have life in his name. So right here, we would have life in Christ. And John is writing his whole letter over and over again. It's pointing that Jesus is fully God, fully man. He is God in the flesh. He is the Messiah. And he repeats that over and over again. So this is my first time with the clicker, so bear with me to see if I get this right. Uh, we're going to go back now into John chapter 15. And um, let me just make sure I'm on track. Here we are. Praise the Lord. So we're going to look at John chapter 15, verses 1 through 8. That's going to be the, the bulk of where we're going to be landing at, and I have a ton of cross-references, so hopefully both of us can keep up. Um, and now, some of the key phrases that we're going to look at in John chapter 15, we're going to see the, the phrase, in him, is going to be, pop up a lot. So take note of in him. In him is huge. We're going to see the word abide. The word abide means to stay connected to, to remain in. And so those are some things that we're going to be uh, looking at today. So John chapter 15, there's great, like I said earlier, there's great controversy over verse 6. Okay, and I'm going to go straight to it. And in, in verse 6, it says, let me see if I can get there, right there. Verse 6 says, if you do not remain in me, you are like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up, thrown to the fire, and burned. So I'm going to start there because this is the controversial verse. And there's potentially three different beliefs here. Belief number one could be that you can lose, lose your salvation, which I'm going to tell you right now, that's not true, okay? Um, so that's not it. Then as I began to study over the years, because I was never settled with that, but that was taught that. So well, I think what, what we have to learn is that as you grow up in the church, whatever church you grow up into, whether it's Baptist, Methodist, or non-denominational, you, you, you begin to shape, your theology is really shaped by the, the preaching and teaching there, and obviously we should all be students of the word, but, but really a lot of our framework is from our influence. And so the influence that I was sitting under, we're, we're going to the direction of you can lose your salvation. I'm like, I don't see that there. I just, I just don't. And, and then the, the next, uh, the next uh, idea is uh, I ran into a theologian, uh, A.W. Pink. And so if, if you like theology, Pink is, is really solid. I like him, but he would teach that this is about eternal rewards. So if you were to go to like uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 13, or chapter, 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 9 through 14, he would talk about um, the rewards when we get to heaven that they're going to be tested through fire, and there's wood, hay, uh, gold, precious stone, and what lasts are the rewards, and what burns, there's no reward. You yourself are saved, but you may have nothing to show for it. So I, I kind of sat under that umbrella for a while, and then I realized that ain't right. <laughs> and so, uh, and then, so really, this is talking about a non-believer. So here's the deal. When we, you and I look at Scripture, context is key. Jesus is talking to the 11 apostles. They're in the upper room. And he, when he's look, talking about in him, in him is to the believers. And then as you look here in verse 6, we'll look at this. Look, if you do not remain, if you do not abide, you are not connected. That's the non-believer. So at, at the upper room, of course, we'll get to it later, we're going to see that Judas exits. And this is, uh, has a lot to do with Judas, but also how we can apply the non-believer here. Pretty crazy. So here we go. John chapter 15, verses 1. 
And it says, Jesus says this, I am the true vine, and my Father is the gardener. But these are written, whoops, there we go, I told you I'm a rookie. I'll start over. I'm the vine, the true vine, my Father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit. Well, every branch that does not bear fruit, he prunes so that it will be even more fruitful. You are already clean because of the word which I have spoken to you. Remain in me as I also remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine. You are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. If you do not remain in me, you are like a branch that is thrown away and it withers. Such branches are picked up, thrown into the fire, and are burned. If you remain in me, and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. This is the Father's glory, that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. Isn't that beautiful right there? Look at the the point of this passage right there in that last verse. You and I are to glorify God. This is all about the glory of God. And we glorify God by what? Bearing much fruit. Proving. It says showing here. Other translations say by proving that you are his disciples. So you and I prove to be disciples of Jesus Christ by bearing much fruit. And the result of that is glorifying the Father. It's all about the glory of God, really. Nothing that we do is about us. It's all about the glory of God. And so, as we look at this, this portion of Scripture in context here, I also want to remind us that in the Gospel of John are the seven I am statements. Okay? Um, in, in John chapter 6, Jesus says, I am the bread of life. In John chapter 8, he says, I am the light of the world. In John chapter 10, he says, I am the door of the sheep. Uh, in John chapter 11, he says, I am the resurrection and the life. Uh, in, in John chapter 10, he says, I am the good shepherd. And then in John chapter 14, verse 6, I am the way, the truth, the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And the seventh I am statement is John 15, I am the true vine. So we have the great I am revealing himself once again, fully man, fully God. And the context, the upper room, and here Jesus is, is talking to the believers here, and remind them, if you are remaining in me, you're going to bear much fruit, and apart from me, you can't do anything. So there's some tricky verbiage used here. If we take a look at at some of the words here, so I'm going to break it down little by little. I've got 10 little mini points here. So number one here, Jesus, he is the vine. He's the trunk, all right? God the Father is the gardener. He's the vine dresser. He's the fruit inspector, so to speak, and Raise your hand really quick. Have you ever seen a grapevine out in the vineyard somewhere? Any, have you ever seen a grapevine, how, how it is? So what, what, the, what the vine dresser, the gardener, does, he has some pruning shears, all right? He's got a, 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 a squirt bottle. He has um, a cloth, and he has some shears. And he's inspecting the fruit, and is it, if it's producing fruit or not. So some of the branches that are producing fruit, he's like, great, prune, and then someone else picks it up. And he goes down there, this branch is dead, cuts it off. This branch over here, what he does is it might be on the ground, it might be getting trampled on, but it's still alive, it's still connected. So what he does is he takes it and he repositions it. He gets a spray bottle, he cleans it up, whatnot, and then he might put a stake in there, or he might actually take that vine and tie it to another branch over there. So either way, that's what the Father's doing. So... The branches there that are us, the believers. Uh, so in verse 2, let's take a look at John 15, verse 2. And, oh no, I'm working it. All right, here we go. And it says, he cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit. So look, so key. Can I get everyone to say in me on three? Ready? One, two, three. In me. Man, that's great. Um, so, Every branch in me, which is connected, right? That's the believer. That bears no fruit. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit. And we're talking about that. While every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes, so that will bear even more fruit. So what does it mean he cuts off? If we go over to um, the Greek, the word is a hero. 
It's A-I-R-E-I, but it's pronounced a hero, okay, <laughs> like a hero. Um, and, and here's what it means. It means this. It means that it, it's taken up. It means that it's picked up. It's repositioned. So we read it in the English language as he cuts it off, but truly it's not cut off like he's hacking. It's really he's repositioning this branch. He's, um, he's picking it up. He's cleaning it up. And the verb tense here, it's a present active verb, meaning that this is something that the Father is actively doing. God is at work in doing this. So think about it. If you and I are in this position, you're a believer, you're in Christ, but you're going through a season maybe of not producing any fruit. God is at work. God is at work. And, 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 and that is so hard because during those times, <laughs> friends, you feel like you're in the pit. When I was church planning in Indio, California, in a physical desert, my wife was going through a spiritual desert. Zero fun, I promise you, zero fun. I couldn't say, hey, babe, you look good. She's like, Psh, what do you want? <laughs> All right, hey, babe, the, the Bible says this. I gave her a verse of the day. Man, like, it was almost like I'm trying to dig in on purpose, like I'm reading her prayer journal or something. Nope, not the case. And it was a difficult, probably two to two and a half years of spiritual desert. But she remained. By God's grace, God brought an amazing woman, discipler, that began to pour into my wife and began teaching her how to exposit the word for herself. And that was just life-changing. And then out of nowhere, one day, the funk was over. It was gone. I can't explain it, but it was just gone. But she remained in him. He remained in her. And then very soon, like very shortly, we actually moved to Joplin, Missouri. And right away, we met uh, through doing youth ministry. Some college girls were helping out. Some were struggling. And she's like, hey, do you think we should open up our basement to have them live with us and maybe I disciple them? We're like, yep. One of them just needed some major discipling. The other one needed discipling and had an addiction to pills and so forth. So what do you think God was doing? God was preparing my wife during this process and bearing fruit, Right? The purpose of the taking away, the repositioning, is so that you would be in a position to bear fruit. That God's going to position you to get the right sunlight, to get the right amount of water, all these things, but spiritually speaking for us, so that you and I would bear fruit. Can I get an amen? So, that's verse 2. Every branch that bears fruit is pruned. Now, I don't know about you, I know we've all, probably I'm looking around the room here, we all know Karate Kid, Mr. Miyagi. Hi -ya. Uh It just came up like on TV last week, so it's fresh. Um, but, you know, I can't think about pruning without Mr. Miyagi in the bonsai tree. Bonsai, Daniel san bonsai. Um, and, uh, but the pruning process for us as individuals, when God's pruning us, it ain't, it's not fun, right? It, it is not fun. It's, it's a process, and so I want to encourage you, beloved, to endure. And my next point is pruning leads to more fruit. Do you, do you see the pattern here that, like, God, he doesn't want his people to just bear some fruit, but he wants us to bear much fruit. Look here in verse 5. I'm the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. But apart from me, you do nothing. Apart from me, you will do nothing. And... Uh, Let's continue. So let me see if I can get this right here. Yes, praise the Lord. My seventh point right here, it says, you are already clean. What? Because of the word that I've spoken to you. So take a look at this. We are here in John 13, I think, verse 10. Let me just flip back over real quick to make sure I'm in the right spot. Take a look at this. Uh oh. Well, I'm going to read John 13:10. I'm not sure if this is the right. It might be a different translation. Oh, there it is. Jesus answered, "Those who have had a bath need to wash their feet. Their whole body is clean, and you are clean, but not every one of you." And Jesus is talking about His word. He, we are washed by the word, right? By the washing of the word, we are sanctified. We're set apart. We're set, we're set apart by his truth. 
His word is truth. So the word sanctifies to be set apart. Now here's the question. Are we set apart from this world? We are we, we're, we're to carefully consider what are the things that are coming into our heart, our mind. So what are we listening to? What are we watching? So we really need to be careful and consider the, the things that are, we're, we're watching. Are we, what kind of music? Are we listening to things that are uplifting to our, our heart, our soul? Is it pointing us back to Christ? Um, you know, I want to encourage you to, I, I call it Sermon Jam. I'll Sermon Jam all day long. I've got a couple of go-to preachers I listen to, and as I'm driving, instead of just listening to maybe just regular radio or nothing, I'm putting on a sermon, Sermon Jamming on my way from maybe one school to the next or whatever, but just constantly feeding um, your soul. I think we neglect our soul the most, unfortunately, but constantly feed your soul. And then the eighth point here is, apart from God, we can do nothing. In verse 5, we saw that, right? In John 15, 5. So we've already talked about the three options. Can you lose your salvation? And the answer is no. That is false. Once you're saved, you're always saved. And let's see if I can pick this up here. Uh Uh-oh. Oh, they're back. Here it is, 1 John. Let's take a look at this. 1 John chapter 2, verse 19. And it says, They went out from us, but they did not really belong to us. For if they had belonged to us, they would have remained with us, but their going showed that none of them belonged to us. Wow. So you can't lose your salvation, but here's the thing that, that we have to watch out for ourselves, and also the leadership of the church is to think about the leadership of the church, the elders, pastor elders, feed the sheep, protect the sheep. And there's going to be false doctrines that might come in here and there, and you refute them, and you protect the sheep. And so they said they were, they were from us. We thought that they're believers. They proclaim, they profess that they're believer, but it says that they weren't, right? They went out from us, but they did not really belong to us. For the, if they had belonged to us, they would have remained with us. But their going showed, it proved, that none of them belonged to us. And that is kind of like what we have to be careful of and examine ourselves. But as you and I examine ourselves, it's really easy, honest, too, to, to beat yourself up sometimes, right? Oh, man, I failed. And a lot of us have two different personalities. Some of us are just really driven by, like, works-based, and it's easy to do, do, do. And some of us are driven by just, um, I'm saved, God saved me, I don't have to do anything. Great. Woo! So there's, there's two sides of the spectrum there, and there's definitely, definitely some balance, right? Those that like to work and do, the doers here, because I lean on that side of, of the doing. We have to make sure that our doing is based out of this, abiding. If I go out and do a work of the Lord, but I do it because I like to do something, I like to be busy, or let's say uh, I feel like I have to, and I'm not abiding, there's no reward for that, by the way. That's just kind of like tapping yourself on the back and move forward. And it's not genuine. When you and I serve the Lord, we should not know what our right hand or left hand is doing, right? And the other side of the, the, the danger scale is, oh, I'm saved by grace, sweet. I can do whatever I want. I don't have to go to church. I don't have to give. I can just sit here and do nothing. That's also the dangerous side. There's definite balance. To those that are in Christ, we're saved by grace, by faith alone. And God's love, we are compelled to go out and do because of his great love. And I'm going to talk about that a little bit more later, how God's grace and works, how they're separate and what the connection is. So we'll we'll get to there uh, shortly. And I just want to remind us here that, um, let me see, yeah, in in Matthew, let's see if I got this here, no, I skipped one. Well, I'll just get to here right now. So at the church that I'm going to right now, we're going through the, the book of James. And the book of James is very challenging, right? It talks about trials and tribulations and how we deal with them. And so in, in James chapter 2, verses uh, 14, here's what it says. If you want to follow along, actually I like to read from the paper sometimes. So in James chapter 2, 
it talks about a faith and it talks about a in James, a lot of people misinterpret it that it's a um, faith plus works, which we know that that's not true. But a genuine faith is a faith that works. Okay? So here's what James writes about this whole um, dilemma of faith and works and how can they coexist together and, and how can they not? How can they not? So it says in verse 14, What good is it, my brothers and sisters, if someone claims to have faith but has no deeds. Can such faith save him? Suppose a brother or sister is without clothes and daily food, and if one of you says to them, go in peace, be warm, and be well fed, but does nothing about their physical needs, what good is it? In the same way, faith by itself, if not accompanied by action, is dead or useless. But someone will say, you have faith and I have deeds. Show me your faith without deeds, and I will show you my faith by my deeds. You believe that there is one God, good, even the demons believe and shudder. You foolish person, do you want evidence that faith without deeds is useless? Was not our father Abraham? This is what I love about the book of James, by the way. It's a commentary for itself, right? It's very straightforward, and here's the commentary on itself. It goes back to the Old Testament, Abraham, and some others. It says, was not our father Abraham considered righteous for what he did when he offered his son Isaac on the altar? You see that his faith and his actions were working together, and his faith was made complete by what he did. And the scripture was fulfilled and says that Abraham believed God, faith, right? And it was credited to him as righteousness, and he was called God's friend. You see that a person is considered righteous by the way they do and not by faith alone. In the same way, was not even Rahab the prostitute considered righteous for what she did when she gave lodging to the spies and sent them off into a different direction? As a body without the spirit is dead, so faith without deeds is dead. So that's the dilemma. That's what we talked about a while ago. It's real. There's a temptation to, to do the works-based faith. And I'm telling you, that leads to work, 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 and it leads to man trying to approve man, and it's unbiblical, and, and there's a danger there. So the common ground here, we've got to be right here in the middle, is we have to think about abiding. As you and I abide in Christ, I promise, as long as I've been walking with Jesus, when I'm abiding in Christ, works follow. The works follow. And, and then, then that's where you see the fruit, right? And then and because we get caught up in striving all day long, but striving will burn us out. On the other side, I know, I've also known people who, oh man, it's all about grace. I don't do, I don't have to do anything. They're, they're that person that, that James talked about, like they see the homeless person and they know they have food, they know they can provide it, and they say, oh, God bless you, brother. May, you know, maybe the Lord's going to take care of you later, and you say, be warm to be filled. That faith is useless. That person is de deceiving themselves that they're actually believers. Does that make sense? And so, James, I love how it gives us that analogy of, oh yeah, be warm, be filled, go ahead, God bless you, right? And I know at some point, it's hard to have discernment, right, do I help out or not? I get that. that that's really hard sometimes to discern, do I help out or not? But when you're abiding in Christ, uh, here's what I do, I'll be honest. Whenever I come across someone who might be in need, homeless or not, if I'm abiding in Christ, I stop and I pray. Lord, what do you want me to do? From that point on, if I go forward, there's no strings attached. No strings attached, and I don't worry about it. If I feel, if I'm abiding in Christ, and I feel led that God wants me to do it, there's no regret. I don't have to worry about if they took advantage of me or not. You don't have to worry about that. So don't let that stop you from obeying Christ in that. Um, the next thing, as we are moving forward here, trying to keep track of my notes on the screen, challenging, is that... Um, Let's take a look here at John 10. This is where it says. John 10, we're going to look at verses 7, I believe 11, and then 27 to 30. So we're going to look at verses John chapter 10, verses 7, 11, and then we're going to fast forward through 27 to 30. So we've looked at 
couple options. Option number one, can you do salvation? We said no. Um, option number two, we looked at what Pink was saying about the eternal rewards. It's just not there. It's a great way to kind of ease off of losing salvation, right? So I went from, okay, I struggled with losing salvation. That's not true. I went to eternal rewards. It sounds good, but it still didn't quite fit. And then lastly, here's the main point. And here's where we're going to camp out for the rest. The Lord loses none that belong to him. If you belong to Christ Jesus, he, you, you can't be lost. Can't run away, can't be lost, can't give back what you didn't have to begin with. So let's take a look at John chapter 10, verse 7. It says, Therefore, Jesus said again, Very truly I tell you, I am the gate. I, in other words, I am the door of the sheep. And then in verse 11 here, it says, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. What did Jesus do? He laid down his life. Jesus is the door. He's the way, the truth, the life. No one comes to the Father except through Christ. He is the door. He is the gate. He is the shepherd. And he lays down his life for those that belong to him. And now, take a look at... Um, now we're going to fast forward to 27. Uh-oh. Oh, no. I went way back. Sorry. I'm not used to this trigger. This thing is pretty quick. Well, I'm not finding it. I'm going to read it from... from one more back? Oh, there it is. Praise the Lord. Thank you, guys. Whew. Verse 27. My sheep listen to my voice, and I know them. And they follow me. I give them eternal life, and they shall never perish. No one, look at that, no one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all. No one can snatch them out of the Father's hand. I and the Father are one. And there's Jesus once again. I and the Father are one. Jesus, fully God, fully man. The Father has given all those that belong to him to him. He says, I can't lose any. The Father ain't losing any. So can the devil come in and snatch you away? Nope. Can any drug addiction or anything snap you away? Nope. If you belong to him, you belong to him. There's nothing that you and I can do to, to lose the salvation that God has given to his people. And friend, I don't know about you, that gives me much assurance. Because if the salvation that I claim to have is in my strength, my decisions, on me, then yes, I have much to worry about. But it's the beholder of the salvation. My salvation is not in my hands. My salvation is in the hands of God. And He is going to keep me. He is going to hold me fast. So, here's the million dollar question. Do you believe and trust God and His Word? That's it. Do you, bottom line is, do you believe and trust God in his word. I mean, it really comes down to some of those simple things. And I'm going to remind us of Romans chapter 6, verse 23. And it says, For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Oh, I was actually on track. Look at that. For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Wages, sin, death. Free gift, God, eternal life. Very simple. And God's a giver of this eternal life. Nothing I can do to lose it. In Ephesians, if you're, I like to say, if, uh, if you're not sure, go to Ephesians. It's got reasons. So in Ephesians chapter 2, um, I would encourage you to Write down 1 through 10 and take a look at it. There's so much richness in Ephesians uh, chapter 2. I'm going to look at verses 8 through 10 with you this, this morning. And Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 through 10 says, For it is by grace you've been saved through faith, and this is not from yourselves. It is a gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. So, 
right here in verse 8, we're saved by grace through faith. That grace that we've been given here, that gift of faith, even the, 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 the faith that we have to believe, that alone is a gift of God. We're not worthy. And He gives us this gift of faith to believe. That is His grace. And then look at verse 9. Affirmation. Not by works. Not by works. So that no one can boast. If I were saved based on the things that I do, you and I, we'd have a bragathon. Oh, I did this. How many doors did you knock on today, brother? You know, how, do you, how, how, was your, how was your service today, sister? Hey, that coffee was on point today. Congratulations, right? Like, it would just be this, this bragathon of, oh, I, I led worship on the worship team. Woo, go Jesus. I had a single arm lift today during worship. Like, uh, you know, but it, we, we can, we can, it would just be this bragathon, but it has nothing to do with that. Salvation is completely separate than works. But if you're saved, there is a work. If you're saved, there's going to be fruit. God didn't save you to hang out. God saved you to take his gospel out to the nations. Amen? That's one way. We're getting close to the close. Promise. Uh, hopefully this is encouraging to you guys. Uh, it, it has challenged me to death this week. I'll tell you that. This has been crazy. So we've already gone through some of the dangers, the workspace versus the profession. And here is a healthy thought for all of us. As I was preparing this week, I had a couple commentaries out. And I read this or listened to it somewhere by John MacArthur, but I don't know where, but I wrote it down. He says, if the word is not ruling in your life, the world will. If the word of God is not ruling in your life, the word or the world will. So let the word of God rule in your life. Uh, And here's another healthy thought for us all to think about and consider. There ought to be a conviction of sin in our lives. So, Here's, here's, here's the, 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 my train of thought. Um, there ought to be conviction. Conviction is by the Holy Spirit because there's, no condemn, there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, so there's conviction by the Holy Spirit, which the Word. If you're convicted by the Holy Spirit, you're a believer. There's no conviction. There's no Holy Spirit. No believer. Are you wrestling? Is there conviction in your life? Right? I want to encourage you, like, that, that is a huge litmus test that I've seen time and time again with people that have struggled. A genuine sorrow for your sin that, is, that comes from the Holy Spirit. And just another reminder, by the way, um, security is permanent. Eternal security is permanent. Our security is not in ourselves, but in the person who is God who's holding it and keeping us. So our salvation is not hanging by a thread on, on our power, but rather in the power of a saving God. As we close here, let me see where we're at. Ephesians. I got some of these verses that ought to bring us that assurance. I love the book of 1 John as well. And uh, First John in, in chapter 5 and in, in chapter 2. I think I missed chapter 2 earlier, but let's take a look at this in, in First John chapter 5, verses 1 through 3. Everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God, and everyone who loves the Father loves his child as well. This is how we know that we love the children of God, by loving God and carrying out his commands. In fact, This is the love of God to keep his commandments, and his commandments are not burdensome. There's another litmus test for us, too, is are God's commands, are they burdensome to us, or is it a joy, right? And we ought to be loving one another. Uh, And then, I think I missed it earlier, so I'm going to go ahead and read it right now. In 1 John chapter 2, oh, I can't find it. I apologize. But friends, what a joy it is to to know that we are secure in God's hands. And um, as we inspect the condition of our own heart and life, um, we need to consider, man, have I repented? Have I repented and believed and turned to Christ? In in Mark 1.15, says the time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. And one thing that I've seen as a setback for, for some uh, some friends and family that are close, is that 
We let pride get in the way. We're trying to sort out, well, I was maybe raised in the church. I was going to church for a season. I had a profession, but there's no fruit, so I don't know if I'm saved or not. So here's what a lot of people are wrestling with. Am I the prodigal son? Do I, do I need to come back? Or, or your question, was I ever even saved? And I would say, you don't need to sort that out right now. The most important thing is, are you in a right relationship with God? Being in a right relationship with God doesn't matter how you get there, right? It doesn't matter if you're the prodigal, or it doesn't matter if maybe you were not saved, you, you had a profession but never uh, got connected, right? Because I've seen that time and time again. So don't let that pride get in the way. My encouragement to you, friends, is to, to be in a right, a right relationship with God. And then for those that are believers in Christ, I want to encourage you to have a prayer journal, have people that you're praying about on a regular basis. Um, don't give up. Don't lose heart. Uh, I know that part of my salvation was I was living with a host family in Redding, California. And I'll close with this story. And I live with uh, Judy and Lee. I still call, I still call them to this day. They're, they're like my spiritual parents. I call Mama Judy. And I would go, and I was wrestling with God. I had a profession of faith for many years, like about five years, so high school up to college. And I was running from the Lord. So at this point in my life, right before I got saved, I was going to church, and then I was going to parties. Like, go to church, go to parties, back and forth, back and forth. And as I was coming back, from parties, Mama Judy, but by God's grace, by the way, he, he gave me a host family that were believers. And so Mama Judy would stay up 1 o'clock, 2 o'clock, 3 o'clock in the morning, out on the deck waiting for me to get back there. And she's like, hey, how's it going? She's like, I'm not going to give you a hard time. just want to know I love you. I'm going to pray for you. I know has God has got something better for you. And I just couldn't believe it. And then after, you know, several months went by, I ended up repenting and turning to Christ, repenting and believing on Him and His plan to save me, and my life's never been the same. So I went from living in total sin and rebellion and started following Christ. After a year of following Christ, called me to follow Him, gave up professional baseball to go follow Christ, and been ministering for the last 20 plus years. So, I love you guys, even though I don't know you. Some of you, I know some of you, but I love you. I love this word. This word wrecked me this week in a good way. And I hope that you got some chicken nuggets uh, to dip in some sauce later. All right? So uh, let me pray for us. Is that good? Well, Heavenly Father, you alone are good. We're so thankful for your grace. We're thankful, Lord, that uh, we can have assurance of our salvation, not on our own merit, but in the hand and power of the Almighty God. And Lord, if you save us, you will keep us. And so we are so thankful for that. And Lord, help us to... Continue to look at Scripture and examine ourselves, Lord. We, we ask and pray that the Holy Spirit would be alive and well in our lives and would reprove us and correct us and to mold us, Lord. So we're, we're thankful for your grace. We're thankful for this day. And Lord, I want to pray, Lord, if there's anyone here who is unsure or uh, they're just wrestling with some things, Lord, I pray, Lord, that, that you would draw people to yourself, Lord. We know, Lord, we're only saved by your power. So Lord, if anyone is, uh, Lord, if you're drawing anyone to yourself today, I pray, Lord, in the privacy of the heart, they say, Lord, I need you. Lord, I give my life to you today. Lord, today, by faith, I believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, fully God, fully man, came from heaven to earth to pay the ultimate price for my life, took on God's wrath, went to the cross, was put in a tomb, three days later, rose from the grave, conquered death, walked around the earth for 40 days and ascended to heaven. Lord, today by faith I believe and trust. Thank you for giving me the faith to believe in you. Thank you for your grace. So Lord, we thank you and praise you for that. And Lord, for those of us who might be struggling, maybe Lord, you're, we're, we're chapter 2 of John 15. Maybe you're pruning us, Lord. It might hurt, but you're pruning us to bear much, so we can bear more fruit and much fruit. And Lord, and maybe some of us, Lord, you're repositioning us. Lord. We're, going, we're, in a, we're in a dark place. We're in a fog. But Lord, we, we know that you have us. So Lord, we just pray, Lord, that you would have your way with us and that we would be able to endure this time of correction or maybe this time of being on our, being in a, in a place of just silence and just you just pouring into us and you just preparing us. Maybe it's preparing. 
So, Lord, we just pray you'd have your way with us, and we thank you and pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Friends, if God's working in your heart, whether you need prayer or anything, I'm sure you can talk to Pastor John or any other leaders here. So thank you for having me, and God bless you. Go. You know what? I, uh, I was totally blessed by that. And, you know, one of the things that I think is part of the reason I'm addicted to teaching the Bible is kind of what Mark was saying is like how he goes through. And the person that got the most out of all of Mark's study is Mark. You know what I mean? I mean, and I, and I th- there were some great nuggets, and I'm going to take them home and sauce them up pretty good this afternoon. <laughs> but that was great. But I also know that that, and, and, it, and I think one of the big points that I got from what Mark was saying is like, you know what, you get into the Word, and you start looking at it and studying it and thinking about it and praying about it. And I was totally impressed by his process of going from one understanding of John 15:6 then another understanding, and then kind of growing through it. I think anybody who's, if you're in the Word, consistently studying, consistently asking questions, consistently saying, well, Lord, what is this? There's going to be these passages, and you grow through them, and you grow in your knowledge of them, and you grow in your interpretation, and then you grow in your walk with Him. And I just, I was, I was blessed. Thank you, brother. Let's, let me just pray for Mark. Father, I just thank you. I thank you for Mark. I thank you for his the, the word he just shared, and I am in total agreement. Lord, that salvation comes from you. We need to abide in you, and Father, you work in our lives. And I pray, along with Mark, that anybody that feels the tugs of you drawing them, that they would surrender that today and give their lives and, and, and just walk with you. And, get, and really understand the joy that there is in Jesus. I pray your blessing. I thank you for what you're doing. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, Mark.
what a friend we have. And what a friend we have in Jesus. All our sins in Greece to bear. serve and worship you, Lord, and knowing that you don't want us, that we should walk alone and bear everything alone, Lord, but that we can cast all our bears and sorrows, Lord, and that you would carry it for us. And we thank you, Lord, that you love us and you're a friend, Lord. Help us, Lord, abide in you, Lord. Help us to be fruitful, Lord. Help us, Lord, to be thankful, Lord, in those times when you're pruning us, Lord, that we can see, Lord, that even though we may not understand in the moment, that you know the bigger picture, Lord, and that you want to bless us and bless those around us, Lord. So help us to be thankful, Lord, in that season of pruning, Lord, and help us to rejoice and reach out to others, Lord, and be a testimony, Lord, of the miracle that you've done in our lives. We thank you and we praise you, Lord. We thank you for the good uh, news of Mary Lynn, Lord, and that you continue to heal her body, Lord, and just be with her to give her joy and love and peace, Lord, and that she will see you throughout all of this, Lord, and see that you always had the bigger picture, Lord, in mind for her. We thank you. We are so blessed. Thank you for being here with us. Amen. God bless you.